Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, one, two, three. Fresh eggs and milk and... If it's not obvious. <laughs> Kristoff, those girls are shooting arrows at you. Yeah. Do you want to do that too? Yeah. Uh, we do have a new bone arrow. Why? Why do we care? Mm -hmm. Why are we trying to answer this question? Why are we trying to, to go to the scientist's table? It has no bearing, in my opinion, as far as what I know now, on whether or not Jesus died for my sins, how old mm -hmm. the earth is. Well, uh, it's a fair question. I mean, a lot of people, you know, when you first look at it and you don't go deep into it, you know, just on the surface level, it's easy to say, oh, you know, what do I, what does it matter what I believe about physics or, or the, you know, gravity or astronomy or, or in this case, you know, evolution or creation. Right, right. Uh, but then you dive a little bit deeper into it and you start realizing that, you know, it does have implications. You know, the Bible doesn't really have a lot to say specifically about physics and geology and, and some of these things, but it has a lot to say about where we come from. And so we look at that and we say, do I believe in the authority and the accuracy of Scripture? Do I believe this is the Word of God? And if it is, what are the implications of that? Not only in the Old Testament, but even in the New. You go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, and there's this whole genealogy of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, what you believe about Jesus is at core to the faith. You know, without Him, you don't have Christianity. And so you look at, you know, Jesus being the, the son of this person, the son of that person, the son of this person. And it's this whole genealogy that goes back to King David, goes back to Abraham. But right there in the New Testament, it goes all the way back to Adam mm -hmm. in the Garden of Eden. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of people that want to say, oh, Adam is a mythical creature. There was no real Adam. There was no real Eve. But you think about it. If you start with Superman and Wonder Woman got together and they had a baby. And then they had a grandbaby and great grandchildren. Well, obviously, if Superman and Wonder Woman are mythical beings that never actually existed, then so are their grandchildren. And so if Adam and Eve were not actual people that actually lived, then what does that say about Jesus, their great, 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 great grandson? So it has direct implications for the truth and the historicity of the Christian faith. And you know, another thing that's really worth thinking about is this idea that there were billions and billions of years of death and bloodshed and tooth and nail and claw. And so when God created the world, did he see all of this death and all of this bloodshed and say, ah, this is very good? Because that's what he says in Genesis. He creates the whole world and over and over and over he says, and God saw that it was good. Did he see all these billions of years of death as a good thing? That was he saying that about death? Mm -hmm. And was it billions of years of death and bloodshed that led to the birth of Christ? So when you start looking at these things, and you also look at uh, redemption itself, because Jesus did come to save us from our sins, but he came to do more than that. In mm -hmm. Romans chapter 8, Jesus, it says that Jesus came to redeem the entire cosmos. You know, we read in the end of the book of Isaiah, when everything is restored, you have the lion eating hay like an ox and you know you've heard the saying the lion lays down with the lamb mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so that gives you a window into what was creation like before the fall All right and when you add to that that it says in the new testament that it was through man's sin through adam's sin that death entered the world mm -hmm. um, that means that for any amount of time on earth prior to adam's sinning there was no death. And if there was no death, there was no evolution. Who were you in America? For 30 years, uh, I, was a, I was a Protestant, ended up becoming a Protestant pastor for several years. And then I discovered the Orthodox Christian faith and my wife and family and I converted to Orthodoxy. And a few years later, I became an Orthodox priest, and 
while we were living in America, I already had uh, some land. We had like seven acres. We had a bunch of chickens. We had some milk goats. And so we were already kind of living this way when we were in America. We had some land. We had a big garden. We had a tractor. We had farm animals. And I had, I'm trying to think, I had been Orthodox for about five or six years before we moved to Russia. So, you know, 30 years I had been a Protestant, five, six years I had been Orthodox. And then uh, once we came here to Russia, obviously there's a lot of things to learn. You know, for example, the language, that's very different. But the other things, living out in the country, having a farm, being an Orthodox priest, I was already doing that in America. Okay, so we were at Father Gleason's house. We came down the street to, to meet his neighbors. This is his neighbor's farm. And believe it or not, over here, these handsome men, father and son, they are from Alabama. Where am I from? Tallahassee. So I've come all the way to Russia and met my Gulf of Mexico brothers here. And uh, Gleason, you are noticing something about the fence that you see in Russia. They don't spend a bunch of money making it just right. They'll just grab limbs and, and make a fence. It's an old-fashioned way. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> So what's what's of note here? What do you guys? It looks like you. Uh, I almost said you're growing some cows, but yes. that's not how it works. Yes, yes. Or is it? That'll how work. It works? That'll work. That'll work. work. That'll work. <laughs> um, and and by the way, these bars are a whole new thing to me that we didn't have in Alabama. They're uh -huh. to stop. They're to keep the moose out. Oh and, really? Okay. And to so keep, it's uh, not about the cows. Then. Yeah, the it's, cows it's mainly just it. so the moose know. Hey, I need to jump here or stay out, and uh -huh. so it, it actually helps with the moose more than anything that we found. Where it's kind of in test phase, but so far where we put them up, it's kind of helped the moose not come and cause problems. Right. So right. I never right. thought I would come here and get attacked by beavers and, and moose. Those are the two. Oh, so how did you guys come to America to uh, Russia? How did you leave America and come to Russia? Well, that would uh, <laughs> pretty much come into going to Orthodoxy. We just kind of funneled through church history, and uh, I funneled through the Greek church originally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, Russia, those are just Soviet people, you know, and, and everything. And, and then, I, then I started looking at the history of that. And from there, we, uh, I was like, wow, they were like Christian for like a thousand years, you know? And then you start looking at all that. And that's, that's kind of what moved us in that trajectory to make a long story short. You have right. an understanding, I guess, of perhaps how Protestant people think and how Orthodox people oh, think. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. My uh, my dad, in fact, had uh, spent a number of years as a Protestant uh, Nazarene pastor. So he pastored he pastored a church for a while. He also spent a number of years uh, traveling around America, singing in Protestant churches, um, preaching, uh, doing a lot of work like that. So I, I literally grew up in you know, traveling with my dad in various Protestant churches all over America of different types, you know, Baptist, Methodist, non-denominational, Church of Christ, everything. And it's, it's really interesting. Um, you know, different people have different stories. Some people are just raised Orthodox or raised Protestant. But for me, really, I just got deep into the Bible, deep into the scriptures as a young adult in my early 20s. And, you know, several years of diving into it, I, I found these different things. As I was struggling with all these things, trying to make sense of the doctrines, trying to make sense of the teachings of Scripture, I found the Orthodox Church. And I, and I found out that, you know, here's a church that was not started in the 16th century. Here's a church that had been around since the first century. Um, you know, the think of the places where the Apostle Paul traveled. You know, he had been to... You know, he had been to Thessalonica. He had been to Ephesus. Uh, he had been really all over the, the what we now call the Middle East. And a lot of the places where there were churches then in the first century that had been started by St. Paul, a lot of those cities still have churches there now. And, and you check and you see, what are they? They're Orthodox churches. For about a thousand years, you basically just have the Orthodox Church. And what they teach today in the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, the Serbian Orthodox Church uh, is the same thing that they taught, you know, in the first two, three, four centuries of the church. And so my family and I, we just made a decision that we wanted to be part of exactly the same church that the apostles had been part of, that, that Jesus and the apostles had founded. And we felt like 
the scriptures that they had written, um, you know, first of all, they, they predated the Protestant churches by many centuries. But second, we could see that the teachings in the scriptures really match what it is that the Orthodox churches do. Uh, of course, again, I'm oversimplifying. It would take hours to discuss all the details of theology and the details of biblical teaching. But we really take scripture seriously, the preaching of the word seriously, and ultimately we recognize that faith in Christ has to be the center. And if we're going to have faith in Christ, and if we're going to make that the center, then we want that to be reflected in the type of church that we attend, the way that we worship. Um, you know, for example, this is just a, you know, this is a simple thing, and yet it's, I think it's profound. God created us with five senses. He gave us a sense of sight, sense of hearing, the sense of touch, the sense of smell, and the sense of taste. And all of creation, including that, he created for the purpose of worshiping him and glorifying him so that we might honor Christ with our entire being, not just our mind, but with our entire being. And I realize there's many different Protestant churches out there, many different denominations, but at least the ones that I attended when I was a kid, uh, they certainly would preach the gospel to your ears. You would hear about Christ in the sermon and in the singing. And you know, and that's a wonderful thing. And, and of course, when you pick up a Bible, you know, or if you see a cross on the wall, um, that preaches the gospel to your eyes, at least to some extent. But then I walk into an Orthodox church and I hear the preaching and I hear the singing and the gospel is preached to my ears. And then I see the icons, the pictures of Christ and the description of the gospel scenes painted on the walls and the gospel is preached to my eyes. And then I smell the incense and the gospel is being preached to my sense of smell. And then, uh, you know, I bow down before the Lord and I, you know, I touch my head to the floor and I stand back up and I, the gospel is being pre preached to my sense of touch as I humble myself before God. And then finally, I take Holy Communion, the body and the blood of Christ, and I taste and see that the Lord is good. And just that experience of realizing that God is preaching the gospel to all five of my senses, that he's preaching the gospel to the entire person, that really, really spoke to us and made a difference. Where have you taken us? What is this? Well, this is Boris Leklevsky. It's an ancient village in Russia. We're about a half hour drive west of Rostov Veliki and only about six kilometers from my house. Pay attention to the world's only product, a unique development that has no competitors in the world. Synthesit. It restores stem cells, restores the hematopoietic system, restores blood parameters, supplies oxygen to all organs and tissues. The unique action of Synthesit is unparalleled and supported by scientific research. It restores energy, stabilizes blood pressure, and restores the overall functioning of the body. It's a real phenomenon. Tens of thousands of people worldwide have already benefited from its help. Visit the links in the description to Synthesis website and purchase it with delivery to any country in the world. This is an ancient monastery. If you rewind about 700 years, mm -hmm. this was all forest, no people. Okay. A, a, occasional villager perhaps maybe wandered out here, but no people really. And then St. Sergius of Radenej gave a blessing to build a monastery here. And then Saints Fyodor and Pavel built one uh, in wood, it was the original church. And then fast forward a little later, and in from 1522 to 1524, the first brick uh, cathedral was built here at this monastery and it's still standing. They still have services in it. I've been in it myself. And they also built this fantastic wall. This is about 13 meters or about 40 feet tall that goes all the way around. And then the remaining churches were built uh, in the late 1600s. Joseph, the final question, because the sun is setting and I have to catch my train. And I got to ask this question um, because I hate it when I watch interviews where people don't get to the heart of the matter. Because everyone knows I'm a Protestant mm -hmm. and you are Orthodox. And they're going to want us to talk about our differences. 
So in a nutshell, a crude nutshell, you know, I was met by people who are basically Protestant, who say the Bible with me and said, look, God is real. Jesus died for you. This book tells the truth. And in this book, you read it, you study it, you get baptized and you live your life as best you can the way this book says, the way God wants you to. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the differences is I'm raised in the church with this idea that like the first century church, you're going to people's houses and, and meeting. You're not necessarily building churches and you're not really into lots of imagery. And what I've noticed is that orthodoxy is. So I'm mm -hmm. guessing that may be the difference. And I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. And what do you think? Like, how would you challenge me? Well, just in a, in a brief nutshell, I would say, if you go back to the first century, the second century, the 10th century, something that the first several hundred years of the church has in common uh, is that there were not any Protestant churches at that time. So, you know, during that time, you can't really find any historical evidence that there were, you know, Church of Christ, Presbyterian, Assembly of God, these types of things. Uh, as far as the imagery goes, that's in scripture. You know, in the Jerusalem temple, in the Old Testament even, you have, you know, bronze bowls, you have icons of angels all over the tapestry at the Holy of Holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant with the angels, and you have these uh, statues of angels in the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. And once you, you know, get later on in church history, it's not only early Christian churches prior to Constantine, but even in, you know, in the 200s in Dura Europa, Syria, there's a Jewish synagogue that uncovered, and it's covered wall to wall in icons of Old Testament saints, mm -hmm. just like an Orthodox church. So it's something we literally inherited from ancient Judaism. Mm -hmm. And we really should not look at modern Jew Judaism to get our picture of the ancient church or you know the early church because modern Judaism is made up of those who did not follow Christ. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the first century, you go back to early Judaism, you go back to early Christianity, uh, you find that really what we're practicing today in the Orthodox Church matches what they were doing then. But to all this, I think Joseph and Joseph will have to say to be continued and how can people reach you, Father Gleason? Uh, one of the best places is to get on Substack and check out movingtorussia.substack.com. Uh, comment on one of the posts there. If you make a note on there that you want to chat, then I can send you a private message and we can go from there. All right, very good. You guys know what to do. Click like, click subscribe, leave a comment, interrupt my speech, share this with your friends, and click the box to see what happens next. just one in a series of videos about Yaroslavl and the surrounding Yaroslavl area. If you're thinking I missed something, go to our Yaroslavl playlist and find it there. The chatter continues, the channels on this platform are disappearing. How do you keep up with Expat American if one day there is no trace of us here? Go to rumble.com right now and follow us there. We love it here and will continue to be here, but if the algorithms decide we will no longer be here, you can still find us on Rumble. I can't lift this. I just lose views because YouTube will punish me. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> you can stop the punishment. Here we have a little bit to our war. Is this still on or is it back? You don't need
need to say anything, but in case they're married, it's very nice. Alosha. Alosha. Now, if I just had brought Tell my us? baseballs, we could right. teach them about American Santa baseball. Mama. You got it? Oh, yeah, 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 American baseball, right. I don't know if Christoph has played baseball or not.